building a brand takes time. This is more a mindset game than a strategy game. Uh, dropshipping is more strategy. It's a more, more mechanical process. You launch six campaigns a day. You test X amount of ad sets. You follow these steps and you can get sales. On branding, it's more like a, adapting a new mindset of, look, I'm going to start this today, but I don't expect to get a return within the next six months or even a year, man. It's more like an idea of I'm willing to do this, which is which is when not a lot of people do it. It's not very popular when I talk about this about it these days because the truth is that people come to dropshipping not because they want to make more money, not, not because they want to expand, but because they want to make money for the first time, right? Hello and welcome to another episode of The Robust Marketer. I am Eric Dick, CEO of ISAC Training, uh, and we have Sebastian Gomez here. Uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about him in a second, but the first thing you need to know about Sebastian is he is one of our headlining speakers at eCommerce Mastery Live in Bangkok, Thailand uh, on December 7th of this year. It's going to be an amazing show. It's going to be our biggest and best show yet. So if you do not have your tickets, for ECML Asia yet, e-commerce mastery live Asia. Make sure you go to iStackTraining.com slash ECML dash Asia. Just go to iStackTraining.com, get your tickets there. Uh, it's gonna be a heck of a show. You're gonna get a little bit of a preview of what Sebastian's gonna be talking about. Um, Sebastian is someone who I met at the Shopify Mastermind event in Atlanta, Georgia last year, and I just found him super impressive. I think he's doing, um, you know, he started at a super young age, which we'll get into it a little bit. He's had a lot of success with both drop shipping and brand building, and he's here to tell us a little bit about the, the way this whole industry is going, what he's seen, and, uh, and I'm excited for it. So welcome to the Robust Marketer, Sebastian. How are you doing? What's up? What's up? Doing great, man. Thanks to have me here. <laughs> Very cool. And so you are from, uh, you're from Costa Rica, which is where you are now. We, that was one of the things we talked about was that you like, why, when you can build a business from anywhere, why would you want to move anywhere else but Costa Rica? Yeah, man. Honestly, like, um, I've been living here all my life and uh, like, I could perfectly go anywhere, but, but I, I want to stay here. I don't know. I just like it so much. It's like when you, when you have a business online, it's almost like a life hack, you know, like, uh, like literally, especially in this country that everything is nearby. You have like mountains, you have like the beach, volcanoes. Uh, I'm a big fan of mountain biking. So you literally have the best places like 40 minutes away. So I don't know, just in general, like this business gives, gives me a lot of freedom. That is what I want, what I wanted when I was in high school, right? That was like my main goal. And, uh, so yeah, man, I love it here. Nice. And not a lot of people take, take it up. Like a lot of people still stay, you know, where they are. They don't, they don't take, well, it's just what you're doing. It's where you're from as well. But not a lot of people use the true advantage you have as a digital nomad. My, um, the guy who I work with here in Victoria, who, uh, runs the conferences, he runs all the, 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 the content, the content for the conferences. He just, uh, yesterday moved to Mexico because why not? Like he's fully remote. The time, yeah, your time not? zone is great too, right? Cause you're, you're the, basically the same as me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I actually went to Mexico like two, no, like a year, uh, a year and a half ago to Cancun, right, and Playa del Carmen. And I was amazed to see how many marketers go live there, you know, at, at like uh, Playa del Carmen, just because it's so nice. It's like the perfect place for a marketer. And a lot of people go to you know, like Thailand and the Philippines, like really nice places just because why not, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Okay, well, let's dive right into it. So first of all, tell us your story. You've got an interesting story. You started super early as a marketer. Tell us about how you started uh, and, and you know, in a nutshell, how you got to where you are today. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, so basically, I started when I was on, on high school, when I was around 16 years old. You know, my, like most people type in make money online on Google, online business opportunities, like all the profitable keywords that you could imagine, I was typing those, right? Um, so... Like I started hopping from one business model to the other. I started with affiliate marketing and, um, you know, I, I, it took me one year to make my first sale. I remember when I made my first sale, it was, I think like a $49 sale. I was on my way to, to, um, to an exam, math exam. I, I was in the bus, right. And I saw my email. I was like, uh, I remember it was catching. You just got your, got your first sale. I was like, so stoked, but, but really it took me a year. And a lot of people say like, man, you're so young. Like, like it, it looks like it's overnight because I'm young, but really I've been learning every day and doing things every day for six years. You know, when I was 16, I'm 22 now. So it's, it's 
in six years you can i mean you learn a lot of stuff and it's not so so you have to like also see that the back part and then from affiliate marketing i bought a i bought a high ticket mastermind online mastermind a 5k um it was affiliate marketing for the most part and in that mastermind i got the opportunity to go to an event in orlando I, they, they told me like hey there's gonna be this awesome event it's gonna be great if you can be there so i was like why not so i went to miami and in that event someone spoke about e-commerce i was like man this is this is so smart because like i was i was thinking about affiliate marketing and list building back back then but i said like you know what you know what with e-commerce like you can build your list and then there's I was limited in affiliate marketing because there are not so many offers in e-commerce. It's like, man, you can sell anything. That's just anything, right? So I was like, okay, you can build your list. You can sell physical products. You can, it's scalable. Um, and it's just really, really cool. So I started doing it. Um, I started drop shipping. That was December, 2016. And uh, I saw success fairly fast. I, I got in fairly fast, honestly, 2016. Most people got in like 2017, right? So I, I, I think I got in pretty early and uh, I saw my first month, I made 10,000 in sales. So I, I didn't do that in affiliate marketing so fast. So I was like, holy shit, this works, right? So, um, and then 2017 kind of like was my breakthrough year because I just didn't stop. I said, I'm living affiliate marketing on the, si on the side and I have to focus 100% on this business model if I want to make it work. And um, I made seven figures that year, drop, drop shipping. I, I would say, I, I think multiple. Uh, but seven figures for sure. And um, and now, well, it's been e-commerce for the most part, right? Now it's just, I'm focusing more on my model and probably we're going to talk a little bit about this in a bit. It's more, what's the long-term plan, right? Because I made a lot of money drop shipping, but, but then, you know, like the internet fluctuates a lot. Facebook ads, you know, Mark, poor Mark, they're hitting him so hard. <laughs> so yeah. Man, I don't feel too guilty. Like I don't feel too bad for him. Um, he's yeah, a robot yeah. after all right i know <laughs> very yeah, cool that's kind of like my story in a nutshell so you started see so when you started uh in 2016 with dropshipping you jumped in early was it literally your first store did your did your first store that you tried uh and how many products like how many products did you have to test before you were like okay i've got some winners here when you say pretty early how how good was it it was as good like i had a i, ha I have a friend right and I was just in his event. His name is Horatio, right? In uh, in Orlando, he made an event. And uh, I said, you know what? I learned about this business model in the event I went to in Miami, but then I know nothing about it. You know, like I don't, I don't, I haven't received any sort of training. So I just sent him, sent him a message on Facebook, and I knew he was making like 2k a day with e-commerce. So I said, like, you know what? I'm gonna see how much he charges. I was his first person that reached out to him for coaching. He said, like, give me a hundred bucks, man. Let's have a call one hour, right? So I was like. Are you sure? Okay. So I sent, I sent him the money and then he literally, on one hour, he showed me what he was doing. I was like, it doesn't look so hard. So I literally, I tested, I think I launched like three or five campaigns or so. And one of those, it was a bottle opener and it just started selling. Like I didn't know what I was doing. It just started selling. So I was like, okay, from $5 to $10 per day to 15, 20. That was all I was doing. I was doing, I was increasing the budget and uh, it was so, so freaking cool. But Obviously now it's not that easy, right? It's, I, I got, like I told you, pretty lucky of getting in at that time. But nowadays it's, it's not, a, I think it was a lot easier for me just because I got in, in that precise moment. It's like affiliate marketing. You know, you started late in affiliate marketing. If you had, you know, you started early for drop shipping, but if you had started, you know, I started in affiliate marketing in 2008. Uh, sorry, 2007. And back then, you, you know, you're running like pin submits and email submits. People are paying you $3 uh, for for zip code. You're paying $2 for zip, people's zip codes and things like that. And earlier in the, in the you know, and it just, it's just the evolution of the space, but everything happens faster now. So whereas affiliate marketing took five or six years to really con constrict, uh, you see dropshipping, this is happening at a much faster rate. So people starting today in dropshipping are going to run into more and more problems. And this sort of leads us to uh, the news of the day, which I wanted to cover, which was a couple of days ago when, when Trump uh, made his announcement that he was going to be ending the 250 year old uh, shipping subsidy from China. So what are what are some ways that that like obviously people running e-packets uh, shipping from China. We don't know exactly how it's going to impact it yet, like how much it, the, the cost is going to be, but it's going to make certain business models very difficult to run when this comes into play. Would you agree? I do agree. Well, first of all, I think it's going to get, number one, more expensive to ship to ship from China. 
And um, I think that delivery times will probably be around the same. I just believe that the price will go higher in general. And uh, it's, it's honestly like it's just getting started. I feel like this is probably one of the first news that we will see over time. So it's not like it's, you know, like it's, always, it's an already developed topic. I think it's just getting started, like the uh, limitations with China and everything. Um, but apart from that, the, I don't think that's the biggest problem, man, honestly. I think, I think that's like, uh, like if you pay $2 more per shipping, I mean, you know, in the end of the day, you just pay it, right? Um, but it's more about the fact that you're shipping from China. The delivery times are, are you know, are pretty high. They're 15, 20 days realistic with the packet, right? Um, the last product that we scaled with dropshipping, my supplier, uh, what they did is that they have like, a, I don't know what they, what it is exactly, but they call it like a club, like a, a fulfillment club. You pay X amount of money per year and you, you are able to join the club and have faster shipping for your customers, right? And so I was using that. It was not as, as slow as e-packet. But generally speaking, with companies setting the, heart, the bar so high, you know, every time there's faster shipping with Amazon, there's like next day shipping, three day shipping. So even if you get on one of these clubs, like my supplier was is part of, even if you get the product in, I don't know, 12 days, it's just not, it's like, okay, but it's not outstanding, right? And I think that only outstanding brands will quote unquote survive in the next years, like, like not good or not great, like outstanding only. And it's very hard, hard to have an outstanding business when there are so much parts where you have no control of. So for instance, how I see it in my head is that let's say a dropshipping business has several parts. The first part is the marketing side, which is Facebook. And in this part, you have full control. Well, uh, quote, quote unquote, full control because you run the ads, you make the decisions, you, you know how many campaigns you want to launch and you spend as much money as you want on it, right? Now you don't have as much control because of the updates, right? So you know, the changes on Facebook. So that's that part. Another part is the fulfillment. In the fulfillment with dropshipping, you definitely have very little control, right? Because of, well, first of all, the quality. I, I, I've been working with Chinese people for quite a, quite a bit. And I can tell you that even if they tell you, like good quality for them is bad quality for you. And great quality for them is like, okay, quality for you. So in my opinion, it's just like, um, even if they say it's good or great, you can you cannot really trust it unless you have the product in your hand, right? So quality is something that unless you get the sample, you will have you won't have control because you can't really trust the suppliers in AliExpress. That's is something I've learned. And then the delivery times when it says that um, the order will be fulfilled in three days, it doesn't even mean it's going to be fulfilled in three days, right? Because that the processing time there's there's processing time and then there's shipping time, right? Processing time can take three to five days. Shipping time can take can take three another three days. So, generally speaking, you as a business owner, well, we as business owners, we want to take full control of our lives and our businesses, right? But when there's so many parts where you simply have no control of, it's, you kind of like feel like, well, I have this business, but I don't really control it. Like I run it, right? But I don't control it. So, kind of like that's been like something that's been spinning through my head throughout the past, I don't know, twelve months. Um, and that's the reason why, I, like uh, a year ago, probably I just decided to like, regardless if I have this dropshipping store on the side, I cannot think that that's gonna be my 10-year plan because it's not gonna be my 10-year plan. It's just a reality, right? So I think it's changing a lot, and I think it's people either adapt really quickly or or be wiped out because, like you said about affiliate marketing, uh, CPA offers, ClickBank offers, you could sell those on Bing and Google like hotcakes, like a diabetes offer, man. And you, Make a lot of money, right? But now it's not that easy. So I think that's that's what happened. That's that's what's happening. Sorry. So talk a little bit about your current portfolio then, uh, about about what you run as an e-commerce entrepreneur. You still have some drop shipping stuff that runs on the side, but your focus has shifted more to one or two brands that you're 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 actively building. Yes, correct. So so for instance, and I'm actually going to show you. I have several of the samples over here, which I'm going to show you in a bit. So. Um, I realized this like a year ago, right? No, not like, uh, yeah, like a year ago. I realized this and I said, you know what? Building a brand takes time. This is more a mindset game than a strategy game. Uh, Dropshipping is more strategy. It's a more, more mechanical process. You launch six campaigns a day. You test X amount of ad sets. You follow these steps and you can get sales. On branding, it's more like a, adapting a new mindset of, 
look, I'm going to start this today, but I don't expect to get a return within the next six months or even a year, man, because it, it takes it takes a lot more. It's, it's more like it's less strategy. Um, I think when you learn how to run Facebook ads, you can it's not a big difference in terms of branding or drop shipping. You just like campaign structure is a bit different, but that's not the big difference. The big difference is saying, you know what, I'm willing to wait to get the samples and then I'm willing to organize, let's say a photo shoot and go to a nice place and with nice videos and then use those videos to retarget. And it's more like an idea of I'm willing to do this, which is, which is when not a lot of people do it. It's not very popular when I talk about this, about it these days, because the truth is that people come to drop shipping, not because they want to make more money, no, not because they want to expand, but because they want to make money for the first time, right? Usually, I, I relate it to a business opportunity, dropshipping. It's more of a business opportunity if you think about it. So the branding business model, it's definitely not a business opportunity, like a get-rich-quick thing. So it's not very attractive. And that's why not a lot of people do it. So to answer your question, basically, I said like 12 months ago, you know, it's probably going to be a slow process. So I'm just going to keep my dropshipping store running that. And uh, But knowing in my head that my main focus is going to be my branded store, which is a women's fashion store, right? Because the drop shipping knowledge that I got, I just said, you know what? I know this niche. I know how to target. I know the designs. I'm just going to do my own stuff with the same niche, with the knowledge. So I, um, that's basically what, I, what we did. Like, I mean, like three months ago, uh, we just scaled a, a product to 750K like in, in 40 days. And we scaled that in drop shipping, right? With, um, actually, I have the product over here. It's like a pair of sandals, right? It's really fun. A pair of sandals, and um, we saw a lot of like 18,000. Um, but but then I told my team, like, we could keep doing this stuff, but I think we should just narrow down our focus and pour, put all our energy, resources, and focus on this brand because it's gonna be worth eight figures for sure. There, there's no way it's like that's I know it's gonna happen, so why don't we just focus 100% on this and go that right route? Not that we cannot find something else. But scaling one of these products in terms of cash flow and everything, man, it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars that maybe if we just put our focus on the brand, it's going to be worth even more, right? So um, that's that stuff. And uh, so that's kind of like the logistics. I think people can start drop shipping, get their feet in the water and start learning, getting that experience, like what niche works for me, what strategies, what designs, but always having in your head, like, I know where it's going, right? Yeah, you know where you're going to want to invest long term and you should be thinking, have that sort of life, build that life raft as you're building and learning the skills. This is kind of what we advocate as well. Um, so I wanted to, so, so when you're, so you've got these two, these two enterprises that are sort of going uh, and it's cool that it makes sense that you're doing, you're working in the same audience space essentially so that you're having, you know, you have, you're learning about the audience and learning about the products. Um, but yeah. So like at what point does, does do things like influencer marketing, Instagram marketing, are you still able, obviously when you're building a brand and you are, you know, you want to run your, your social media, you want to run Instagram as well. You potentially want to work with influencers. Are you still working with influencers on the drop shipping side as well when you're not building a brand just, just for like the, the, the transaction, you know, just for the, the fact that they can drive sales still, or do you only reserve that for your brand? I only reserve that for my brand. And here, here's the reason why, right? So, with drop shipping, most people will never get a sample, right? Because let's say if you're in the US, you can get a sample for China, quote unquote, quickly, right? Because it's like maybe seven, 10 days, right? But if you're in a country like Costa Rica, and trust me, like 50% of people, 60% of people are international, you're never gonna get a sample in 10 days. It's probably gonna take a month, right? So when you don't order order samples, it's not realistic to tell an influencer, hey, can you use my product? Can you use my product in a live video and wear it? Because like if you order a shirt, first of all, you never know if the sizing is gonna be good or bad, high quality, the sizes are gonna be off. Maybe the Chinese supplier will tell you it's US sizing, but it was really Asian sizing. So you cannot realistically tell an influencer to go on a live video to use your product if you've never seen it before. It's not, if they don't like it, they're not gonna show it to their audience, right? So since this is the case, what most people do on influencer marketing with dropshipping is go to kind of like these viral Instagram profiles, like uh, the gadget profile or whatever the name is of the profile, where there's not a celebrity. There's not like a person that represents the profile. It's just like cool stuff, cool memes, cool gadgets. They make a post of your product and, they, and you drive traffic to your store. 
that's how you do it with dropshipping because unless you actually get the sample and unless you actually know that it's a good product, you cannot send it to an influencer, right? So that's kind of like the influencer marketing model for dropshipping, uh, where you just tell a viral fan, a viral page to promote your product. But when it comes to branding, you know the value of your product and you know it's so good because you put time into the development of the product. You know it's so good that you can perfectly go ahead to, uh, in, my, in my case, women's fashion, we do like uh, tropical designs because of Costa Rica. Costa Rica is kind of like the, the what, what inspires the brand. So we could perfectly go to a, a girl, right? And tell her, hey, we have these products. We think they're a perfect fit for your brand. You're going to love them. We're going to sell them for free. And would you be willing to shoot a live video using our product? And we just ask for, for a fee, if you have a fee, et cetera. We negotiate. But in this case, it's a different story because now when the influencer goes live wearing a product, that the connection between the audience is a lot different, right? When, when, when the celebrity is using the product in a live video, remember this person already has a relationship with your audience, with their audience. They're, like their audience likes them. So if you, they were a product, they want to buy the product, not because the product is good, they, like it's going to be good, but because the person is wearing it, right? So the, buy, the conversion rate is going to be 10 times higher because there's a person, there's a relationship that happens before that is there to back up that transaction. And um, that's so freaking powerful. And you cannot have that in dropshipping if you don't know what you're selling. So I think it's just two different types of influencer marketing models, right? And you just, that's why like, even for branding, man, like you can do influencer marketing to a whole other level. Like the deal with the influencer can be, I'm going to pay you so that you make the live video, not, not just a post, the live video, right? And I'm going to pay you more to do that because I'm going to make more money. Here's an interesting. So yeah, I, I totally see what you're saying, and it it makes sense. If you're just slamming, it's if you're if you have the mindset where you're if you're slamming dropshipping products and you send it out to influencers, and the packaging is crappy, maybe that influencer will and the product isn't great, and you haven't seen it. Like maybe the influencer or the or the viral site will still throw it up there, but the connection won't be there. All that invisible stuff of of like, wow, I had a good customer experience when I received this you know, it won't be there. And so it won't be as authentic. Whereas when you're building the brand, you take care of the packaging, you take care of the whole customer experience. And that is the same thing that the influencer experiences as well. And then that will come through in their post, you'd like to think. Yeah, exactly. Like, trust me, um, the nowadays influencers value their audience. They guard them. They guard their audience with their life, right? Like literally they are, they think about their audience all day, like sleeping, in the shower, they're like, how can I add value? How can I, how, how can I get my audience to like me? So they're never going to be willing to promote a shitty product on their story or on their profile because they don't want to ruin the relationship with their audience. Like, I don't promote, like, almost anything, man. I, I get probably affiliate offers uh, to promote softwares and stuff like that every single week, and I, I turn everything down because if I don't use the product myself, how, how can I promote it to my audience? It's not ethical, right? So I, I got to be sure that it's actually something valuable. If it's valuable, you see me like talking about apps sometimes, like like shop message or some apps that actually make me money, but because I've used them and I'm not going to sell something that might not benefit my audience. And that's how influencers think. And when you have full control over everything, you can guarantee that, I mean, they're going to like your stuff. Yeah. One of the, I had a really interesting conversation with a friend of mine, Colin McGuire, uh, who we're going to be doing some really cool stuff with, and he's doing influencer marketing, uh, where he'll, he'll basically come up, he'll find an influencer, he'll, he'll find his ideal influencer and he'll pitch them on actually creating a collection around that influencer. So instead of just having them use a product, he, he basically gets them to do a photo shoot or a video shoot or whatever, pays them whatever he has to, and but gets them to license their image for him to use actually on his site, not just on his ads. So then he actually gets the influencers um, promoting the brand externally, but then when people come, they see that there is a collection by this particular person. And I think, I don't know, I feel like for apparel, there could be a, an interesting opportunity potentially there as well. Is that something you, you've tested or would consider testing? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there's this brand that I that I follow. It's very, very successful. I'm not sure. Well, you might know about it. So poor idea bracelets, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, very, totally. Very yeah. yeah. Huge. So these guys, they have an influencer that's uh, the profile of the influencer is called Dreaming Out Loud, right? This girl, her name is Haley, 
and she's been one of the top ambassadors uh, for Pura Vida bracelets for a long time, right? Very successful. I would say probably the most recognized influencer because she appears everywhere in their photos and everything. The other day, I just went to her profile and they made a, and she has for her personal brand, she has specific colors that she uses, a color palette, orange, blue, light blue. That, those are the colors that define her. So we made, basically, she made a deal with Pura Vida bracelets where they made her own collection with her brand colors. And she literally posts stories, collection, we, have, we, we just got stuck of my own collection of the Dreaming Out Loud collection, put out bracelets, and then like, like one day later, sold out. And they open and close, open and close. And it's not because of the colors, who cares about the colors? It's because of the relationship that Haley has with her audience. So, so powerful, man, that's, that's so good. Yeah. I realized that the other day, and now that you say it, I was like, holy crap, yeah, I saw that. Nice. Um, so one of the things you talk a lot about, uh, it, uh, that, you know, we've in pre-discussions as well, and I think you've alluded to this earlier, but I just wanted to make sure we, we put it in this way. Cause I think it's a really good way for people to think about it is you want people to move from being a marketer in their business, which is what happened with the drop shipping craze. Cause you could control the marketing and, and you could drive sales with the marketing. And then the rest of it just kind of sorted itself out. You threw up a Shopify shop, you plugged in Oberlo or all these other sort of uh, maybe AliExpress drop shipping sites. And then you were able to just, you were able to drive the business by being a marketer. But in today's day and age, you say that you can't be a, you can't just be a marketer. You have to think about your business like a CEO. Uh, talk about that yeah. a little bit. So I say this because when I first started, I was the graphic designer, the marketer, the, the everything, right? And, um, and when you're drop shipping, you focus a lot on the marketing because like 95% of your traffic on drop shipping comes from Facebook and Instagram. So if you're not a good marketer, the traffic that you send is not going to be profitable, which I don't know, you either make money or lose money. So when you have marketing skills, when you just focus on being the marketer, that's good because like 95% of the traffic comes from Facebook or Instagram. But when it comes to branding, marketing is literally like, for instance, on dropshipping, let's say that you cut a, you cut a, a cake, right? Uh, and you, and uh, a huge slice, 90% of that cake will be like marketing, right? On dropshipping because the traffic comes from Facebook or Instagram. On branding, when you brand your, your e-commerce story, let's say you divide that cake in, I don't know, five parts, 20% content, 20% product creation, 20% marketing. It divides more equally. So that's something I realized that I was like in drop shipping. I was making a lot of money by myself because I was just launched campaigns and I scaled them. And then I told my VAs and to, like, to help me with fulfillment, etc. But when it comes to branding, like there's, you got to pay a ton of attention to the other things. Like you can't imagine how big of a deal it's graphic design. It's so much, it's a huge deal. That's why I'm telling people like Fiverr, don't use Fiverr, man, because it's like you need someone that takes care of the whole graphic design department, congruency between the store, the products, the post on Instagram, everything has to be like one single organism. So what I tell people is like you will start realizing that you have to become the CEO once you build a brand, not so much the marketer, because the marketing is just 20 percent of that cake and not like 90 percent of the cake like in dropshipping. Congruency. That's a word I think of again and again, where, you know, customers are so skeptical. Maybe they've been burned by bad, you know, drop shipping businesses before, or they're like customers, they're, they're buying a lot still, but they're getting savvier and savvier. And if you do not have a congruent brand, if, if something looks off, it, people's spidey senses will be tingling and they'll leave your store immediately, right? Where did you find your design resource? Where you, so design is such a powerful resource. You don't advocate Fiverr. Where did you, how did you go about finding the, the, the prime design resources for your brand? Yeah, so the, th the thing with Fiverr, the reason I said that is because in Fiverr, you are using mostly freelancers, right? Like, like freelancers, like, hey, can you make a logo? Then can you make a post? Then can you make a cover photo? It's not like... It's like individual work. When you treat when you treat the graphic design as individual stuff or individual tasks, you be, you you don't create a congruent brand, right? And this is something I learned. Like the difference between a freelancer and what we call now a graphic director, it's a completely different thing, right? A graphic director takes care of all the graphic design vision and not so much on a specific task. So. How does this collection fit with the concept of our store, the story of the store? How does, how, how does the Instagram post look um, compared to the design of the store and the collection? Then 
like everything, man, like the colors. Does do the are the colors like on our store? We're more like a tropical vibe. So my designer was like, "Hey, we need to remove all the black colors. We need to completely redesign the the the, the colors of the store and everything," which is what what they just finished doing. And they you cannot have the color black on your store. I was like, "What's wrong with black? I always use black. Like you know, black font is like it just doesn't look good for a tropical brand. It just doesn't look good." I'm like, "Okay, like you're the boss." So. It's like this. It's more like a um, consultant, graphic design consultant that takes care of the whole big picture of the design and also manages the sub graphic designers that do the kind of like the tedious work and the time consuming work. And when you do Fiverr, for instance, you don't have control over that. Like you cannot get, usually cannot get on a call with a guy on Fiverr. So if that, that congruency is what generates high conversion rates. Like people are saying the newest software. Uh, you know, the newest uh, scarcity timer, what's the latest conversions hack. Honestly, man, you don't need any of that stuff. All you need is when you build a trust, when you build trust with your audience, you have congruency and people like your brand, they're going to buy it. Not because of the scarcity timer or, or the little secure checkout badges. They were going to buy because they like your stuff. Like in Sarah.com, for instance, they don't have like fake scarcity stuff. They just like shirt, buy, you like it, you get it. You know what I mean? This, the conversion rate topic is not so much because it, it's not so much related these days on what's the latest conversions hack. It's more about do you have that trust with your audience and, um, and that congruency, right? And when you do have that trust, it opens up a whole other world of, of tactics uh, and of things that you can use. You may not have to use them as well, but but when you have that connection, if you approach it honestly, I feel like like I, I think of um, of Greta Van Riel. You know, uh, and her, her her the fifth watches brand basically, and they they use scarcity, but it's very real scarcity, and it works. You know, like and and Pure Vita as well. Like they they you know with these collections, like they 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 make these collections, they make them limited, and then scarcity in that context. When you have a brand and when you have a connection using influencers, it just becomes so insanely powerful. She did six figures in a minute the first yeah. time she launched her, her watches there. So it, it, yeah. It, yeah, once you can level up and get a, a congruent brand, it opens up a whole world of incredibly powerful tactics as well. Yeah. No one is buying the fake scarcity, man. No one. Yeah. Like, like real scarcity is when you have real scarcity, it's a completely different. People know it's crazy. Like even if man, you're say you're in your house and you're in your little room and people will notice throughout their phone if they're dealing with real scarcity or fake scarcity. And also, you build a reputation of is this real? Is this brand act? Does this brand actually have real scarcity or fake? Right. So, for instance, uh, with uh, Fifth Watches, um, everyone knows it's real, right? <laughs> they close, they close. When when uh, if we're a bracelet, they they close, they close. When you build up a reputation of real scarcity, it turns out in the long run you end up making a lot more money because when you when you build that up, maybe in the first month, people are going to be like, maybe it's fake, maybe it's real, let's test it out. But when they get a, a taste of it and they realize that it's real, then uh, you just won because you can literally just say like, hey team, let's make a new shirt. This is the design we're launching in October. Let's make the anticipation the scarcity. It's going to be sold out. Yeah. Not, and uh, so when you, when you reach that point, man, it's not about finding a winning product. You can make any cool design and it's going to sell right so cool. you start switching the mindset from winning products to everything works out of a sudden right <laughs> very cool okay so let's let's do, do an example here so uh let's say that i've started a print on demand company i i, I have a i have different vendors plugged in I may, i've got some jewelry i've got some some other things i'm going i am trying to go after a niche market a specific market let's say moms or uh you know p proud parents essentially proud parents of of of, of kids um, what, what are the first steps in your playbook to start creating a brand aside from having a strong designer, having a strong visual flow? Like what, what are the actual like tactical steps you need to take in order to start a brand? Right. So the first thing is, um, so I, I kind of like divide it in, in 10 steps and that's what I'm going to be speaking in, in the event uh, because I, I said like, you know what, I can be talking about this branding stuff all day, but. But we're really like, there needs to be a way to implement all this information. And everything starts, the, the first step that I had um, there is the brainstorm, right? Literally, that, that's, in my opinion, a tactical step, like getting a document out on Google Drive and literally saying, so what's the concept of my brand? 
what's the targeting, the exact age range, gender, what are the, and then what I do, a tactical step is list of a hundred keywords, right? Keywords that describe your brand. So for instance, if what I'm doing is a tropical brand, I'm gonna put stuff like coconuts, sand, rocking chair, hammock, then the food that the avatar eats, maybe salads or fruits. It's just a hundred lists of keywords that describe your brand. And then your designs, like actual product designs, your graphic design on your store, everything, even the content on your Instagram profile, for instance, everything is gonna be according to the, those 100 keywords. So those 100 keywords are basically the, it's the, what shapes everything. It's just what describes the, from graphic design to product creation to everything, right? So you need to have a document where you literally say, this is the document that describes everything we will be doing from now on. If you don't have the document, there's, like I told you, it's gonna be uh, incongruent. So that's that's gonna be the first step. Um, second step, definitely, once you have that, you can have the business name. And the business name needs to be definitely related to the list of keywords. The list of keywords is everything, even like to, to choose the name, I feel there needs to be congruency. For instance, this brand called SandCloud, right? I don't know if you know, I think they were in Shark Tank, they make seven figures. Okay. Just the word sandcloud.com. So if you take a look at their brand, they support marine conservation and like, um, you know, like nature and all this stuff. And the word, the, the, the title describes um, the, the concept, right? Sand, cloud, anything in between, we take care of it. It's like the symbolism behind the name. And then getting the, the, the creative director, the creative director uh, is gonna be creating proposals for designs and collections. Not so much like, well, designs and, uh, designs and maybe patterns or prints, like I'm talking about women's fashion for the most part, but these designs and these proposals, you will, you will start seeing if they look good on phone cases, on towels, on um, all these kind of things. And actually, you know what? Uh, is it okay if I show you some samples just to sure. get an idea? Yeah, I'd love to yeah, see. So I have some of them. I actually hit the. Um, I have it over here. I have a ton of samples from my. So basically, we we order samples of everything, right? So we have this. We have this design. You take a look at. This palm case, for instance, this is a proposal, right? It's like uh, kind of like the leaves in a palm tree. Yep, I know those things, yeah. So then we just said that was the original proposal for the design. But then we started saying, okay, maybe it looks cool in a towel, right? We have a towel over here. Yeah. The same thing, right? So that's how you get started with uh, product development. And this stuff, by the way, is print on demand, it's printful. It's yeah. Like, it's Super high quality, and, and uh, I have a, my phone. I use one of these on my phone. It's really good. So everything starts with list of keywords, business name, creative director, proposals of designs, and um, and then you start doing. Like, we have so much stuff. We even have like like sweaters, and these are all print on demand. This is like um, these are like this is like a graph of the wave patterns in the in Costa Rica. Oh, that's like awesome. The, yeah, like the tide and the wave patterns, stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, man. And then with products, you can do a lot of stuff, like videos, content, ambassadors, influencers. Once you have your theme, like, and that's that's something that's one of the things that's super important is the angle. And I think a lot of people, it, it, it's you you have to think very carefully about like what your angle actually is and and how you can address that angle specifically. Like even in my example of like okay, uh, gifts that mothers are going to buy their daughters is sort of is the theme of this imaginary store. Uh, that and and but I don't even know if that's enough of an angle. You know you have you, you know you 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 have this tropical angle. Like it really that seems to be like the theme of the store is like people that want to. Uh, you know, experience the tropical vibes or the peace of mind that you get when you're in a tropical location. How, what are some steps you actually took to, like, because not only, like, that's not an interest necessarily that you can throw on Facebook. Like, how did you go out and find the, the people out there who are really into this tropical culture? Yeah, actually, I started realizing uh, this when I, because I, I first, I did a lot of testing on, on uh, dropshipping, right? I, I sold... Many of my niches were like mermaid, dragonfly, and uh, hippie, bohemian. 
and I don't mind to say this stuff, honestly, at this point, because like this is my main focus. Mm -hmm. But when I when I started going into the Bohemian niche, um, I started selling a lot of products that were like beach products, you know, products that you would wear on the beach. And I realized mm -hmm. that this niche is very, they relate this Bohemian style to the beach and the tropics for whatever reason. I'm not an expert on Bohemians. I just like sold stuff over there. But then I said, like, you know what? I started selling like these shirts and beach bags and sandals that they could wear on the beach. And my images had like, like those environments, like tropical. So I just said, I started targeting like Bohemian interests and, and, and hippie interests. And I said like, these people like the beach. You just gotta find which audience likes the beach, for instance, in our case. But from there, it doesn't mean that for, for this brand, we have to target Bohemians, right? We could perfectly target uh, Hawaii, surfing, snorkeling, sun tanning. Um, so, so yeah, man, it's like, it's like, that's what actually dropshipping got me. Um, apart from money, it got knowledge that yeah. allowed me to yeah. make better decisions. So you, I think it's very valuable, the knowledge that you get with dropshipping. You may not be a bohemian expert, but I bet being a Costa Rican, you are a beach expert. I am. Yeah. And, and <laughs> I bet you are. That, uh, yeah, for sure. And apart from that, like even you have to do something that gets you excited, right? Because yeah. since this is a long-term strategy you have to find something that gets you pumped. So just the fact that, for instance, we were planning a, a photo shoot to go to the beach. Right now it's like rainy, it's horrible, but let's say probably next weekend or so. And just the fact that you can go on the trip to the beach with the photographers and the models and all that stuff, it's like, like it's cool, right? And uh, it's just something I like. So that's why, that way, uh, that's why I started doing this like tropical style thing, like more, more specific than tropical. You have to be extremely specific our brand is not like Puraya bracelets, they're tropical, right? Mm. But in my opinion, for instance, um, like Puraya bracelets, it's more like a Cali vibe, right? California mm. vibe, not so much like a real Costa Rican vibe. Because I, yeah. I, I live here all my life, I know what the roots and traditions and uh, of the country. So let's say the roots and traditions of the country are reflected on our products. It's, we're not having the Cali vibe, which is totally different. So uh, that's kind of like our inner, inner concept. And uh, it's very easy to create products when you have that clear. Very cool. Uh, here's a, here's a question. You don't have to answer this if it's too specific. But I'm, I'm the beach is such an interesting thing because it's like a state. It's it's a physical location, but it's also a state of mind. I think for a lot of people, is they they're happy when they're thinking about the beach or when they want to go to the beach. With your targeting and and where your sales generally come from, are they from places like California? and Costa Rica and places that have amazing beaches? Or do you find that the sales come from all over the place? Like people like in the middle of America, for instance, that don't have any coasts near them, but they just, they're sort of, maybe they have a vacation coming up or they just feel good about buying beach stuff for the summer. Yeah, so it, it's mostly people that have been to the beach before, regardless of, the, of where they are, honestly. So in, in Cali, there's a lot of like, there's, it's kind of like split equally in my opinion. Because people in Cali, for instance, or in Florida, like since they're already used to the beach, they don't, they're not so passionate about wearing stuff because they're already used to it. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of like spread through different, you know, places, people that travel, been, have been to the beach and they want to be there because they, for instance, someone that, that lives on the city, they want to maybe wear something on the beach just so they can feel that desire to be there like many many people i see they're they're working offices and they have this huge um this huge wall art of the beach and it doesn't mean they live on the beach but maybe they just want a desire to be there so it's also that it's also an angle right you can even use that as an angle like hey like with the desire to be in the beach this is the perfect thing for you yeah right or or do you wanna or maybe like an angle for people that live over there so more like equally honestly that's interesting so both yeah both people who live the that's an interesting idea though that the people in florida like they don't need to wear the beach on their shirt because they live the beach they're from the beach but uh but yeah so it has a broad appeal regardless of where people are from that makes sense um yeah, okay so you the, oh yeah sorry uh, and then the same thing for the sandals right they're like yeah. uh, like beach product because they're open open shoes um we, we got sales literally from everywhere, like New York, like everywhere. And I was, I was pretty amazed because I was like, like even some cold places, man. <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, I think it's like desire mostly. Yeah. It's a state of mind. 
Very cool. Okay, so you gave, you gave us two uh, items, I, and I don't think you should give us any more. If you want more of the two items you need to build uh, to build a brand, the Brand Building Boot Camp, as by Se- Sebastian Gomez, you've got to come to Bangkok. It's, it's a beach place yeah, as man. well. You've got to come out yeah. to Bangkok. Are you going to be doing anything? So you're coming for our event. It'll be your first time in Thailand? Yeah, man. You're going to love it. So excited. It's going to, I'm, I'm actually staying there till the, I think, 18th or 19th. Cool. So you'll head down to the beach and everything after the fact? Yeah. Nice. Well, after sure. our event, I'm going to be at Tim Bird's um, retreat. Tim Bird does a retreat in Phuket. So if you come to Phuket, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll send you a link if you're interested. It's going to, oh, it's, sure. it's not really a mastermind. It's more just a social gathering. He'll love that I'm plugging it on here. But I went last year and it was ridiculous amounts of fun. Okay. And so you should either consider coming to that or... Um, and I'm, I bet Tim can cut you a speaker's discount because you're both speaking at that at e-commerce mastery okay. live, uh, but it'll be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to cover today. I'm, I'm super excited for e-commerce mastery live. What's what would, what would be your plug for e-commerce mastery live for, for anyone listening? Yeah, I think it's going to be a great opportunity. I saw the, I actually know a lot of the guys that are going to be speaking. Uh, some of them I don't personally, but I, I can tell you that the information they I've learned a lot from them, right, actually. And um, it's going to be really, really crazy. So regardless, like, if you're dropshipping or if you're looking to build your brand or if you just want to get an extra help on the Facebook ad side, like, there's going to be a little bit uh, of everything from what I've seen on the speakers. Um, and they're absolute beasts, right? Like I told you, I've learned a lot from them. So a totally, a total um, great opportunity for anyone. And yeah, man. Very cool. Can't wait to see someone, some of you guys there. <laughs> For sure. Okay. There, oh, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about. You made a post a little while ago and I thought it was really cool. I think it speaks to your mindset as a, as a solid entrepreneur, someone who's trying to build for the long term. You made a post about an investment that you made. Uh, regarding, you know, you've made some money in dropshipping. I think a lot of people who make money in those early days, so many of them, you won't see them again. They won't be able to build a sustainable long-term business. And you made a post about some, what some of the things that you've done with your earnings from from dropshipping, investing specifically in real estate. And I think that's such a, a good message for people in the audience who found some success to really make sure that they're investing in things that have long-term potential, even outside of their business. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, man. So one of the biggest things is that I see people forget uh, why they started in the first place. Most people get started uh, online as a, as a way or as a vehicle to gain freedom, time freedom, location freedom, and financial freedom. But as you start making some money, you start forgetting that you started for that in the first place, and you start trading the freedom that you earned for, you know, for other stuff. Like most people start online, they make money, and, and they buy, they start spending the money in, in things that, in my opinion, are like are not congruent with the reason you started in the first place, right? Hmm. So if you started for freedom and then you're spending all your money and starting from scratch every time, then it, it's, it's not congruent like with the reason you started. So what I'm doing is I've always had that vision, like regardless if I started making it or no, I knew that my, my long-term goal was the freedom, right? So my game plan is very simple. My game plan is make money with the internet, regardless if it's e-commerce or affiliate. I do some affiliate marketing. Uh, I only promote click funnels, but I make some money with that. And regardless of any income that I produce online, it just goes to real estate, to real estate, to real estate. Um, in the past 12 months, I, I bought three apartments, which got me super excited because it was a freaking dream of mine to get one of those by the time I was like 20. So, and then I just said like, Man, like if I can get three, then by the time I'm 30, if I can get 30, right, and I can just have them rented, I, I have them fully rented, the three of them. It's like, man, like real estate is, in my opinion, the long-term plan. And and my message is not like you have to go to real estate. My message is like, like remember the reason you started in the first place. If it was for freedom, if you made 250K, don't spend that on a Lambo. That's 250K, right? <laughs> Unless you want to be in the rat race forever and be a slave of your own business. I just think like people have to remember that stuff and um, you know, one day you make a lot of money, it's very easy to spend the money. It's a lot easier to spend the money than to make it, right? Yeah. Just swipe. And just keep swipe. it. And to keep it yeah. is the hardest part. And, and especially if you can keep it and grow it. Do your apartments cash flow positively? Yeah. Or so close? basically what I did is 
th this was kind of like my my idea with it, with this because since I'm very young, I don't get like it's hard to get to get credit, right? Uh, if you if you've never bought anything before, if you don't have any debt, I don't owe anyone money or anything at the bank. So you said uh, the first two, I bought them cash, right? And the reason I did that was because I wanted to have positive cash flow on two. Mm -hmm. So if one was not rented, one was still producing. Mm -hmm. And by by buying those um, cash, I was able to set kind of like a foundation so that I could go ahead and tell the bank, like, look, I have two. If if, you, if for some reason I don't pay my credit, like you can can just take one of them, like the other ones, right? So when the third one, I, I got it with credit because I want to build up my credit. Very, very important when you're in a young age, you want to build your credit. So I just went ahead, it was pretty easy for me because I just said like, you know what, I, like I already have two. And uh, like this third one, I, I just put like, I think it was like 20%, the minimum. And uh, then it's rented and it's paying, it's, it's paying by it, itself, you know, like it's just, so I'm not so much about you know, making money right now, like I have to making positive cash flow, but even if I had the three of them breaking even, I'm happy because I'm an owner of three yeah. and I'm using the bank's money to be the owner of three. So um, my game plan from now on, now that I have, I pay two upfront and the one with credit, like more, like all of them that I'm going to get right now are going to be credit, right? Because why would I use my own money to purchase them? All I needed were, were the first two to set the, the base. And then from there, I'm just going to do credit, 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 credit. <laughs> Amazing, man. Well, good luck on your quest for 30. Are these are these in Costa Rica or around the world? Uh, in Costa Rica. So I want to have all my eggs in one basket, like here. In here, I don't know. I don't trust too much the situation here for a lot of them. I don't know. May, anything can happen. It's a small country. Um, third world countries are a bit more unstable. So I want to invest in the U.S. and learn, learn to do that. I am also on an island, uh, you know, pro I'm in Victoria, British Columbia, which is on an island. And so I'm always hearing things about global warming. And uh, so I want to make sure that, that my investments are diversified off of islands always as well. Yeah. <laughs> nice. yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I think there's a ton of really good information here. I think our internet connection is breaking up a little bit. Uh, so let's call it a day. And I look forward to meeting you in Bangkok. It's going to be a lot of fun. For sure, man. Thanks for having me here.